Thanks for being here today. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Cass Sunstein, um, who truly needs no introduction. Um, as we all know, he is the husband of our beloved HKS professor, Samantha Power. <laughs> but in addition to that, he's also well known for his book, Nudge, um, for, for being a pioneer in the field of behavioral economics and public policy. Um, Professor Sunstein was recently awarded the prestigious Holberg Prize for his contra interdisciplinary contributions. Um, and in the words of the Holberg Committee, um, they describe Professor Sunstein as one of the greatest intellectuals of our time. Um, so having anchored our expectations appropriately <laughs> for the talk, um, please join me in welcoming Professor Sunstein. Okay, so I'm completely thrilled to be here for two reasons. Uh, first and foremost, the amazingness of this community of people, some of whom I know, uh, not all of you, Soon, I hope all of you. And second, because this is uh, early work, and I feel I have a tiger by the tail, and I'm hoping that both in the discussion and maybe uh, future work, this is, would be even better, future work by people here, uh, we can make progress on these uh, not small issues. So uh, speaking of uh, uh, spousalness, um, uh, <laughs> When I lived in New York with uh, Ambassador Power, uh, we were privileged to, to live in, or uh, uh, something to live in, I'm not sure privilege is the right word, because it was a little like the prison, in the Waldorf Towers, which is incredible. And it's, a, uh, it's a, for a country boy from Massachusetts to live in the Waldorf Towers, pretty exciting. But every morning in the first weeks and months there, the people who worked there would say a very cheerful good morning to me. Good morning, Mr. Power. Yes. <laughs> you, you can't hear so well. Ah, sorry. It's going to get quieter. <laughs> okay, is this a little better? Uh, so the Waldorf people, my friends, would say, good morning, Mr. Power. Good afternoon, Mr. Power. How are you, Mr. Power? Did you enjoy your day, Mr. Power? And after a while, one of them became actually a friend of mine. And it seemed not quite right that he didn't know my name. So I said to him, actually, my name is Cass, Cass Sunstein. And you can call me Cass or Mr. Sunstein, whatever is most comfortable for you. But, but that's my name. And, and he looked at me with incredulity. And he said, that's, uh, that's astonishing. <laughs> uh, that's incredible. You look exactly like Mr. Power. <laughs> and, and that stuck in my mind because it was about rational updating, given his prior. <laughs> but that's not what this paper is about. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is not so unlike what you're seeing. It's not so unlike something I saw at Columbia Law School in the 1980s. I was teaching a large class, and there was a female student of mine who was in the hallway with a professor, kind of colleague of mine, much older. And it was worse than that. He was uh, stroking her hair, uh, just in the hall in plain sight. And it was very unusual and awful. And I saw for just a flash, just a moment, uh, an expression on her face that was worse than a grimace. It was, uh, you know, uh, just short of rage, but it was a very negative flash of emotion. And when he left, I said to her, uh, that was completely inappropriate, what he was doing, that was terrible. And her response to me was unforgettable. Uh, she said, it's completely fine. Uh, he's an old man. Uh, it's not a problem. And I felt that uh, ashamed of myself that I had intervened in something that was not, none of my business. And clearly, uh, she didn't have a problem with it. And what I had read on her face was not there. I made a, a mistake, and it was embarrassing. Um, then I went back to my office, and half an hour later, there was a knock on my door. And it was the student. And she was uh, in tears. And she said, he does this all the time. Uh, it's horrible. Uh, you were not allowed to tell anyone about it. Uh, my boyfriend says I should complain. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, but it is horrible. 
Um, I won't tell you until the question and answer if you wish. I might disclose exactly what I did. Uh, I did not violate her instruction, but I did do something. That's a footnote. What was interesting to me about the event was the reversal with her clear conviction that I found credible that this was not a problem for her to her uh, being unleashed evidently by my picking up on her grimace uh, to say what she actually thought, which is to say that she has been falsifying to everyone but her closest friends, I guess, and then just by accident me, uh, what her actual experience was. OK, that's the first story. Uh, the second story is from just you know five minutes from here by walking, and that's Harvard Law School. And what you're seeing is um, kind of the full flowering of an event which I'm about to tell you about. I was walking into the law school cafeteria, and uh, a set of students came up to me with evident agitation, asking me what I thought of the seal. And because I care about animals, I thought <laughs> there was some seal at the New England Aquarium. And I almost said, is the seal OK? <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I had enough presence of mind not to be sure that's what they were talking about. And, and just to confess, I don't know what you have in mind, what you mean. And they said the Harvard Law School seal was um, uh, produced by or owned by or uh, associated with something very direct. Someone who's not only a slave owner, but someone who was an egregious advocate of racial hierarchy and slavery. And uh, the question was, should we get rid of the seal? And since I'd never heard of this, I didn't have any particular view. Uh, but it was a memorable encounter. Um, their, their clear disappointment and surprise, which I get, that I didn't know what they were talking about. Now, this is a very different event from the Columbia Law School event. I think it's behaviorally really different. And I want to connect these two different events to three questions. Uh, the first is why social change is often so difficult to predict. The second is why does it happen so rapidly. And the third, which is a little broader than the first, is why are cultural successes and failures with respect to books and movies and music uh, often so surprising? Why is this confounding? even to people whose business it is to be good at this sort of thing. OK, so there are two phenomena which are associated with the two tales. Can you hear me in the back? Are you happy you can hear me in the back, or was it better when you couldn't? <laughs> OK, so the uh, first idea is that social norms often constrain uh, the expression of preferences, beliefs, and values. These are hidden. When norms start to shift, people are unleashed, they say what they think. So you can think of the Columbia Law School story as you know, a really micro version of hashtag me too, in which people had experiences and preferences and values that were um, not very widely known. And once the norm started to disintegrate, that is the norm in, star in favor of self-silencing, uh, something became a flood. OK, that scenario suggests that social change is often unpredictable for two separate reasons. The first is people are falsified their preferences, so it's hard to know what they are. And I have um, a, a belief, which is that with respect to one or two things, uh, people in this room have uh, something like an objection to something they've encountered in the last five years, which has not been voiced. It might be a deep objection. It might be a secret. It might be a soft objection, but nonetheless objection, an objection. It might be connected with a social ill, but you've told hardly anyone about it, maybe only one or two. That's a hunch. OK, so one reason social change is unpredictable is that people aren't saying what they think. And once they start to, then uh, we can have something massive. The second reason where we can do a little arithmetic, or some of I'm not very good at arithmetic, so some of you can do the arithmetic, to model the extent to which social interactions of a specified kind can lead to movements 
uh, that would otherwise stumble and dissipate. So the old threshold models of collective action by Granovetter can easily be crafted onto a threshold model by which hashtag Me Too becomes famous or not so much. And I'll say a little bit more about the notion of social interactions. Okay, there's a second phenomenon which is radically different from the first. And I believe, though I can't prove, that the Harvard Law School steel, scale, the seal is the second phenomenon. And the second phenomenon is that social norms alter preferences, beliefs, and values. They don't unleash an antecedent preference or value. But people come to hold a commitment that smoking is um, offensive and wrong, that failing to buckle your seatbelt is self-destructive and dangerous, that saying something ugly about people in wheelchairs or with Down syndrome is unacceptable. And people come to say that or believe that not because norms have changed in a way that allows them to express their antecedent belief, but norms have changed in a way that alters preferences and beliefs and values. So to be a little more concrete, it's plausible, I think, to think that the general attack on Confederate-type statues and other legacies of slavery and Jim Crow uh, is associated with phenomenon two rather than phenomenon one, though it's possible it would be phenomenon one. And the way you'd know is was it the case that people, African Americans principally, but others, who passed the Confederate statues in, say, 1998, thought, what? There's a statue of that person? I'm skeptical that people were actually thinking that, which is to say it's more like the seal than like the Columbia story. Okay, this uh, is Harvey Weinstein, and there, as between phenomenon one and phenomenon two, we know it's phenomenon one, yes, that similarly situated women, I think that might be his wife, but women who were interacting with him, they uh, were like my Columbia Law student, but much more extreme. Uh, the answer is a lot less obvious for Brexit. It's possible that Brexit unleashed, Brexit unleashed antecedent antagonism toward uh, the EU and towards the weakening of uh, national identity. But it's also possible that what happened was there was the birth of a new norm or a new value, which was fueled by, let's call them, norm entrepreneurs, who didn't have any antecedent thing with which to work but which had some uh, principles to which they could point that would perhaps have appeal. Probably there's a mixture for Brexit. Okay, now I'm gonna give you some data from an old study uh, of outrage. And this is an old study I was involved in. And I think at least this co-author of the study uh, remains uh, relatively clueless about the uh, full implications of our data. So this is a way of telling you that this is a study that has a kind of esoteric quality, but the data is very rich, and I think the authors of the time didn't appreciate what we had, and uh, so uh, here's uh, a little description. Uh, the first study is designed to measure punitive judgments technically punitive damage awards by juries. But the way to think about this is to think, of, think about punishment as a social phenomenon and the psychology of punishment as it is uh, unleashed in human beings who are confronted with bad behavior. And what we did was to take cases of misconduct by corporations of different degrees of egregiousness it could be a corporation that produced an exercise machine for old people that broke down and injured them. That's really bad, yes? Or it could be a corporation that produced a baldness cure that didn't work. Now, in my view, that's worse than anything imaginable. <laughs> I learned from our data that most people think that's not that big a deal. They were kind of bald anyway. They're not worse off. Okay. On a bounded scale of 0 to 8, we found that Americans generally agree 
about the outrageousness of conduct, at least in the cases we designed, so much so that a group of six would predict very well what a group of, another group of six would do. Um, we also found, though, that with respect to dollars, the monetary measure, people are all over the map. There's a lot of unpredictability. Now, what's noteworthy in that finding is there's old psychological work that helps explain it. If you all are asked, how bright is that light on a scale of zero to eight, where zero means pitch black and eight means blinding, blindingly, light, blindingly light, there will be a lot of order. You'll all probably be around four for that light. And that is how brightness of lights and loudness of noises and awfulness of conduct is generally lining up if we have a bounded scale in which the points on the scale are meaningful. But if you ask people to engage in an enterprise which has an unlovely name, scaling without a modulus, which means a bounded point at the bottom, no bound at the top, and there aren't isn't a modulus to tell you what the various points mean, people will be all over the map even if they don't disagree on anything. So if I asked you how bright is that light on a scale of zero to infinity, you all would be in various different places. And it's not because you disagree on anything, it's because of the scale. OK, the scaling without a modulus finding, I think, is um, underappreciated as a phenomenon in many domains that involve punishment. Let's bracket that point. In response to the study just described, some of the critics said, did you have deliberating juries, or did you just create them statistically with a computer? The answer? statistically with a computer. The critic responded, aha, what kind of validity is this? We responded, terrific validity. A jury, on average, will end up in where the median member was. The critic said, how do you know that? Good question. So we followed up with a very large mock jury study involving deliberating juries. And it turned out that we were wrong. The median member and even the average member did not predict where the jury would be. It turned out that when people were mad, that is when they started out at five on the bounded scale, the median member, then the jury's gonna come in at six. There was a severity shift from a position of outrage, which is to suggest a deliberating group, deliberating group of outraged people ends up more outraged than it was before it started to talk. With respect to monetary measures, we were even more wrong. That is, deliberating juries end up higher always than the average member or median member, so much so that in 27% of cases, the jury ended up with a monetary award at least as high as that of the highest member. Okay, what's noteworthy about this is if you have people who start out mad, meaning outraged, the likelihood of group outrage intensifying is extremely high, which is uh, suggestive, for better or for worse, about how uh, group outrage is heightened. Okay, uh, the basic explanation for our finding, I think, uh, has to do with uh, two phenomena, one of which is well known, and the other of which was invented by my co-author on this paper, uh, Daniel Kahneman, and which has gotten no traction in any literature. It's one of his, he probably has a lot of great ideas that aren't famous. This is, I love this one, and I hope in the fullness of time we'll go understand it much better. Okay, the first finding is that groups and, and typically end up in a more extreme point in line with their pre-deliberation tendency. So if your group people are a little bit mad, after they talk to each other, they're going to be a lot mad, which tells you something about hashtag me too, doesn't it? Either if it's phenomenon one or phenomenon two. And the mechanism behind group polarization, we can just identify in two different ways. That is two kind of uh, sibling explanations. The first, if you have a group of people who are mad or outraged on moral grounds, the number of arguments that will support that outrage as the group talks will be pretty high. The number of arguments that will undermine outrage in the group will be pretty low. 
and the group will be hearing arguments, if they're listening to one another, they're going to be really mad. Just because as a statistical regularity, the number of arguments will be dominated by those that favor the pre-deliberation tendency. The second kind of sibling explanation is, I think, more interesting and really relevant to hashtag me too and unleashing phenomena. And that is an individual asked to express a moral conviction or uh, uh, indignation about misconduct will tend toward the middle, either because of existing social norms or because of a natural inclination to humility. So when my student said, um, it's not a big deal, one version of the story is she wasn't really lying. I think that's not correct. I mean, lying is too strong. She wasn't really concealing. One version is she kind of thought that given the time. This was the 1980s. And whether, that's not, whether or not that's true of her, many of us subjected to injustice or something not good have said in part of our minds, not good, but it's not that big a deal. Once your original reaction, which is this was a wrong, is corroborated, then you are more confident, and then your view becomes more extreme, just speaking descriptively. And then on this account, which has an empirical paper that I have no involvement in behind it, what we observed with respect to our juries is a link between corroboration, confidence, and intensification, where once people are agreed with in their initial inclination, then they feel the, it more strongly. And once they feel it more strongly, what was a five becomes a six. That exercise machine that broke down and injured that old woman, that's not just bad, that's really bad. Okay. Uh, the common idea, he called it rhetorical asymmetry. And the idea is in any conversation among people who disagree about something, it's possible that given social norms, one side has an automatic upper hand. This isn't about group polarization. It's that in any argument about some topic X, one or another view is automatically in a stronger position. That doesn't mean it will prevail, but that means the other side's on the defensive. Now, here's how we tested the proposition. It was an ingenious test that was Kahneman's devising. Why don't we go to the University of Chicago, which a conservative law school, and say, imagine you're on a jury. You know nothing about the case. You don't know any of the facts. You are arguing for a lower punitive damage award with respect to corporate misconduct. What do you say? Then we ask another group, same size, you are a jury, you want a higher <coughs> punitive damage award. What will you say? Then we ask both groups, what's easier? What's the argument that's easier to make? And it was an unlikely group because they're not you know, all negative about corporations at the University of Chicago Law School. But you could see from the answers, they said about lower awards, well, you'll get over deterrence, you'll give a windfall to the plaintiff, uh, the money will be passed on to consumers. For a higher award, we have to have a strong, have a strong signal to other corporations. We have to deter admitted wrongdoing. If anyone deserves that extra money, it's the plaintiff who was hurt after all, not the corporations. And people said, strong majority said, it's easier to argue for a higher award. So what I hope you're thinking is that given existing social norms, a deliberative process will naturally favor one or another side in any a whole host of arguments. And that helps account for uh, what's observed. Okay. It's not entirely clear from our jury data whether we have phenomenon one or phenomenon two. But there's recent data, which is like a fruit fly experiment, where we know which it is, and it's phenomenon one. It's unleashing. And it's really simple. People were asked uh, in 2017 whether they wanted to give money to a xenophobic organization, an organization that really doesn't like foreigners. There were two conditions. Under one condition, they were guaranteed anonymity. And in another condition, they weren't. 
let's call this the control experiment. And in this control, there's a significant difference between the percentage that we'll give to a xenophobic organization. And it's a lot higher where anonymity is guaranteed. I'm going to make up a number, but it's roughly 37% will give if not guaranteed anonymity, 52% will give if guaranteed anonymity. Don't take those numbers to the bank, but that tells you the, uh, the, the rough magnitude of the difference. Okay, call that the control. In the treatment condition, people were told in 2016 that President Trump is leading in your state. That seems like an irrelevant fact, but they were told that. Then they did the two conditions again. Guess what happened? Anonymity didn't matter at all. It mattered zero. Reminded of Trump's lead in their state, people thought, oh, I don't care if it's anonymous. The experiment was also run a year after, uh, a few months afterwards when President Trump had been elected. And once reminded that President Trump was the president, President-elect Trump was going to be the president, then similarly the disparity between the anonymous condition and the anonymous condition disintegrated. Okay, this is just a way of saying that priming Trump's popularity was a signal of the collapse or weakening of the norm against xenophobia. And xenophobia I want to use as a descriptive rather than a normative term. It seems normatively frighted. But just take it as an organization whose self-understanding is uh, there's a problem with foreigners in the United States, and we don't want a lot of them. Once people saw that that was a socially shared conviction, at least to the extent that President Trump was really popular locally or nationally, then anonymity ceased to matter. Now take that as very much like a form of hashtag me too, in which people are unleashed to express publicly what they actually think, because they think that the norm is heading in their direction. There's a movie that won the Oscar a few years ago about a uh, rock singer named Rodriguez, he's still alive, who was a 1970s musician, and I confess that while I'm a big fan of music of that era, I've never heard of Rodriguez. How many of you know this movie? Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so for those of you who don't, all you need to know is that he was super popular in South Africa, and hardly popular at all anywhere else. And the movie asks the question, how come, uh, poses that question. Uh, one possible answer is that he was the beneficiary of a kind of hashtag me, me too that was not morally freighted, but that was um, uh, offering a strong informational signal and possibly a reputational signal that he's good. And that is why he took off in South Africa and not in the United States. Okay, there's an experiment involving a music lab uh, from Princeton a few years ago where the basic idea is that people can visit a, uh, a, a website and they can download songs from not well-known bands and the question is whether exposure to previous, the number of previous downloads um, predicts ultimate popularity. In the control condition, people didn't see anything about previous downloads. They just heard the song, and their merit should prevail. In the treatment conditions, people were sorted into eight worlds, let's call them, in which they could see how many people in their world had previously downloaded the songs. And if the question is, would previous downloads, as perceived by the maybe downloader, affect ultimate popularity? Now, the stunning finding is, while um, the worst songs never rose completely to the top, I wrote one of the worst songs. <laughs> That's not true. I could. <laughs> if I really tried my hardest, it would still be one of the worst songs. Um, they never went completely to the top, and the best songs never completely collapsed. Otherwise, anything could happen, which shows the immense power of the informational signal 
given by the perceived judgments of others on ultimate success or failure. So you can see this as a morally uh, unweighted um, uh, hashtag me too, which is not the unleashing phenomenon, but which is the second phenomenon. It's the seal phenomenon, roughly. At least on one view of the seal phenomenon. OK, so now we have, I think, more clarity on why rapid change can be very hard to anticipate. The first is preferences and values are often hidden. They may be unthinkable, not in the sense that they are unthought, but in the sense that one doesn't think that morally. And this can be true of something that's hateful, like Jews should be in extermination camps, or something that's the furthest thing from it, which is human beings have equal dignity. And that thought, as specified, can be silenced through a social norm. But once the social norm starts to soften, because of a norm, norm entrepreneur, let's say, then something can happen really quickly. Because there's a prescriptive implication that if social change is sought to be engineered, the smart thing to do is to have a very visible entrepreneur and to have her get joined in a hurry by others who think the same thing. And the second point, which I signaled briefly before, is that uh, social influences can make all the difference. And it, Rod, the various Rodriguez worlds, we can call them, in which a song can go crazy in a good way or collapse, is often dependent on the uh, loudness or quietness of the informational signal given by the perceived preferences of those who went early, which suggests something that I also think uh, people involved in behavioral science have paid too little attention to, which is the potential presence of multiple equilibria. So this is a way of saying, I don't know if you all read science fiction and read about parallel worlds or alternative history. Embarrassingly, I love that stuff. <laughs> and uh, the real reason I love it is kind of like an eight-year-old boy. But the reason I would like to think I love it is it tells us something profound about the contingency of social states and the extent to which small changes, uh, a voice here, uh, a, uh, a joiner there, uh, a news story, can make things fundamentally different from what they would otherwise be. And here the suggestion is that um, any version of hashtag me too, where you can think of it as the attack on disability discrimination, uh, the rise of veganism, uh, can occur very successfully in one era or another, just as a result of uh, social interactions that go to one level of volume in one place, but not in another. I think that's what the movie um, Searching for Sugar Man is about. We often are tempted to think there's some deep cultural explanation for social change. South Africa is different from the United States. The time was right for this. And that might be true. But it's worth wondering whether that's basically a just so story. And the micro explanation is much more about someone who said something at a key time that created the relevant volume. OK. Um, I think I want to hear you all. So I'm just going to give three concepts and then end. Um, OK. Two of these are unoriginal. And the least interesting is, is original. And I confess I'm interested in the, the least interesting. So the first idea is preference falsification. And what's I'm excited about in this is that what you're hearing is some work in economics and psychology and political science whose presence in the world of behavioral insights is basically zero. So the question is, can we in the next 10 years or something uh, do some integration? The idea of preference falsification is that frequently people will state under the pressure of social norms something very different from what they actually think. And that is um, uh, a fact. 
and it's a signal of the potential for transformation. Uh, the rise of Brexit and President Trump have something to do with that, though also phenomenon too. So preference falsification, think of it as the Columbia story. The adaptive preference is, I think, more searing, S-E-A-R-I-N-G, than the preference falsification. And the adaptive preference idea, well, Tocqueville, speaking of slavery, uh, said, shall I call it a blessing of God or the last malediction of his anger? That, and now I'm going to mangle the quotation a little bit, but that propensity of humanity that gives it a, a taste for its own affliction and uh, makes it unlikely to uh, struggle against the deepest forms of injustice. So what Tocqueville was urging is that people who are subject to pervasive whatevers often say it's not a problem, not because they're falsifying their preferences, but because they're living under circumstances in which beating one's heads against the wall is uh, painful. And so the preference adapts to the existing situation. No preference is being falsified. The preference is endogenous to the circumstances. Okay, there's a, a social theorist named Elster, E-L-S-T-E-R, who wrote a book called Sour Grapes. That's the lead essay, where the argument is that the fox doesn't want the grapes because he perceives them to be sour. But the reason he perceives them to be sour is they're unavailable. And in an attack on utilitarianism, Elster argues, you can't defend the unavailability of the grapes by reference to the fox's preferences. Because the fox's preferences uh, are an artifact of the unavailability of the grapes. So the defense is circular. The preference is non-autonomous. It's a product of deprivation. And then the claim would be that sometimes preferences are adaptive to social injustice, which makes unleashing not possible because nothing has been unleashed, and which makes phenomenon two necessary in order to get something going. You have to have something to work with to make phenomenon two work. And we could talk about why in the Confederate statues context or the seal, there was something on which people could fasten. But I think it wasn't the particular thing on which the fastening occurred. That is, no one cared about the seal for decades, even if they cared a lot about civil rights. Something like that. OK, here's the, uh, the idea that I'm a little obsessed with right now, which is partially adaptive preferences. And here the idea is that in our heads, some of the time, we have two voices. One of which says it's not a big deal, and the other of which is, is complaining. And the voice in the head that is saying it's not a big deal is often silencing the complaining voice, for better or for worse. But it's not Tocqueville or sour grapes. It's not adaptive preference. And it's not preference falsification either. It's that the preference is uh, quieted or diminished by virtue of something, either social norms or perceived intractability. And under circumstances of partially adaptive norms, um, uh, circumstances are pretty good for rapid social change. I think I'm just going to give an example of this from the United States, which is some of the most interesting histories of the American Revolution are completely on what, what's now being discussed and claiming that it's phenomenon two and not unleashing. Claim. Uh, the idea is that before the 1750s and 60s, basically, the United States is a very hierarchical society in which people who are economically lower would look down as the wealthy people passed and seldom expressed any resentment or concern about it. They just looked down. Now, this is phenomenon two according to the authors. They're not seething inside or thinking, this is a violation of a norm I hold. But in the American context, and I've been immersed in this in 2017, uh, the extent to which authors in the period are speaking of uh, norm change is, uh, what's the right word? Startling, almost uh, 
uh, your eyes pop out. Because they're seeing such things as this. In the late 18th century, Americans are transformed from subjects to citizens. One of the first historians say, this who was there, say we were subjects. Then we woke up and we were citizens. That's immense because citizens possess sovereignty. And for current right readers, I think you and me, this seems a little bland. But this is huge stuff. If citizens possess sovereignty, then we can't have a king. If citizens possess sovereignty, then the logic is the notion of a down look at wealthier people. WTF? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thomas Paine put it as bluntly, not more bluntly than anyone else, but as bluntly saying, our style and manner of thinking have undergone a revolution more extraordinary than the political revolution of a country. We see with other eyes, we hear with other ears, and we think with other thoughts than those we formerly used. Now those words can kind of, the first sentence particularly, can slide by. But notice that Paine is writing in the context of the political revolution, saying, no, our style and manner of thinking have undergone a more extraordinary revolution. And that is phenomenon too. I think the point I want to close on is we can't know from the historical accounts, I think, whether the American Revolution really was phenomenon two or phenomenon one. It might have been a lot closer to my story from Columbia Law School than historians have been able to pick up. Done. <laughs>
you know, why do people, let's say, from Finland tend to send the smartest kids they know to Berkeley? We could give some kind of deep explanation about Berkeley and Finland are closely connected in multiple ways. You know, they kind of similar. similar. That was a crazy talk. It's probably more consistent with your question. It's a cascade effect of some sort. The, someone knows someone who, and then Berkeley's the place to go. So there's, there's much more work to be done. And in the hospital context, which doctors end up wanting to work in which hospitals, which patients go to which hospitals, especially for people who are imperfectly informed, they don't you know, trust or understand very much data, they just ask, well, what do you, what do, you do to people they know? I think that this, this is, is, you're on to something profound, and if, if where I certainly at most have scratched the very tip of the surface, and if we want to give a behavioral science component to it, uh, one obvious thing to do is to think about the availability heuristic working with cascades. So if there's a particular event that's arresting, either positively or negatively, that can create a cascade where the event goes uh, viral and is taken to be uh, telling us something that is common, either that it happens all the time or that it happens some and it's horrific. So uh, on hashtag Me Too, Harvey Weinstein was the focal point for an availability cascade. And I'm thinking for things that aren't morally freighted, you know, it can be a product that breaks or doesn't work. And then the company's in big trouble, even though it just happened once. Okay, self-driving cars. It looks like self-driving cars are in some trouble these days because of a recent event. It's not clear at all that self-driving cars deserve to be in trouble, but there's a bit an availability cascade. of a, a book, I think it's called Investor Behavior. It's a behavioral economics, behavioral finance book, which so far as I can tell, sells very poorly, though it's a good book. And <laughs> the author tweets, I follow him, he tweets regularly, my book is doing much better than expectations, thank you. <laughs> now, I, I believe he's truthful, his expectations were with some <laughs> <open. laughs> But he's signaling a norm, not a morally freighted norm, but a consumption norm, and it's smart to do that. So generally, to engineer social change, and President Trump was, was and remains terrific at this, meaning skillful, to signal the popularity of a thing, namely himself, <laughs> is, uh, is, is other things being really helpful. And the Obama campaign did that too by signaling it had more money than the Clinton campaign at a very early point, which was designed to create a cascade. Now, you're asking also a more subtle point, which is getting uh, discussion. It, it could be potentially destructive if you unleash not only, uh, let's call it uh, angels, but also devils. And then the question is whether the talk of the angels uh, intensifies the action, worst case, of the devils. And uh, hard to know. I mean, the reason hashtag me too, my understanding is, has worked well in the United States for those who think sexual violence and sexual harassment are very bad things, is that 
uh, the backlash has not been protective of harassers and rapists. The backlash has instead been, well, flirtation is okay, and some of this is more like that. And that is accepting the fundamentals of the attack. So I'm, I'm giving kind of a, a, an optimistic view, which is that uh, unleashing an experience of somewhere between horror and injustice uh, is generally good as a way of reducing its incidence, but not always. Um, just going back to the xenophobia example, um, apart from the priming, to me it's very concerning that 50% would have these views and that this is being unleashed. Um, connected to the, that last question, um, apart from releashing, is there anything to get at the heart of the fact that this exists? If we can objectively agree that xenophobia is a bad thing, can the underlying feeling be addressed, or is it just a question of releasing versus? Okay, that, that's also a really good question. Um, okay, and I'm obsessed with this question also, so uh, I'll give you some data from a new study uh, I've been working on where we just have a draft as of yesterday. Um, but let, let's talk about the xenophobic study, xenophobia study for a moment. It's a little less alarming than my capsule description sounded. Because if you look at the xenophobic organization, that's a real organization, uh, xenophobic is technically the correct word, but it's not hateful. It's uh, contentious stuff that people, a certain number of people are embarrassed to want to give to publicly, but it's not, you know, uh, foreigners should be in prison or anything like that. So it's, it's more, it, if you looked at the full study, it wouldn't be quite as alarming. It, to the extent that it is alarming, here's the, the, let me tell you about the recent study, not ready for prime time, but I hope to be it in a week. Uh, we are asking people to identify shapes to figure out which one is a blap. Now, a blap is not a real thing. <laughs> so, but there's a learning task where they're trying to figure out what's a blap. Okay? Imagine you're in a, you decided to go into a little experiment. Is it a blap? Is it not a blap? Is a square a blap? Is a circle a blap? Is a hedron of some kind of blap? And you're trying to figure it out. As you're trying to figure it out, you are presented with the views and you are learning about the expertise of four other players. And you're seeing what they think. And you're saying, if you got it right, if they got it right. And on the first round of the experiment, you were learning about your own ability with BLAP identification. You're learning what is actually a very hard question, what is a BLAP? <laughs> you learn something about it. And you're learning who's good and who's not good at BLAPs. As you are doing this experiment, you're being asked a bunch of political questions, too. Uh, do you like Brexit? Uh, is a big increase in the minimum wage going to have good effects? And you're, lear you're both answering the questions and you're learning what your other player, the other players think on political questions too. So as you're done with the learning phase, you will learn how good you are at BLAPs, how good the other four players are at BLAPs, and what the other four players' political views are. Now you will be able to know, and our players did know, uh, whether the other players, A, are like them in their political views, but really bad at BLAP identification, or, I'm just going to give you two players, unlike them in political views, but really good at BLAP identification. So you know all that. That's phase one. Phase two of the experiment, you are um, asked uh, to try to win money by identifying BLAPs. So now you've learned a lot, and it's a little like a TV game because you can choose to consult one of the other players if you wish. You can choose which one. And you can choose to change your mind once you learn what the other player thought. By the way, the other players aren't actually players. They're, out, they're algorithms. <laughs> Didn't tell them. <laughs> but we got our RV approved. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. um, so uh, the, the key question is, will people choose to hear from 
and will they be more influenced by BLAP identifiers who aren't that good at BLAP identification but think as they do? Or will they choose to hear from and be influenced by people who don't think as they do but are really good at identifying BLAPs? And guess what? Bizarrely, people want to hear from people who share their political convictions even if they're not good at BLAP identification and they're more moved by people who think as they do who aren't good at BLAP identification than by people who think differently and are really good at BLAP identification when they've learned enough to know that they're losing money that way. Okay. What exactly is the explanation for this finding, TBD? But I think it gives an answer to the question, uh, or at least one answer. If you want people not to believe a political view, one route is for them to learn that people who generally think like them don't share that political view. So, so let's, let's describe it as anti-Semitism. To learn that people who share your views on any number of things aren't anti-Semitic and they think it's ridiculous, that's helpful. To learn that there are people who don't think like you do, who deplore anti-Semitism, not so helpful. Just a quick one to go back to, I'm sorry, I'm Daniela, I'm here at the Kennedy School. Um, we discussed that often there's a precipitating event, so somebody says something at the right time, or something happens that changes some of that conversation. And even in the Me Too example, uh, by all accounts, people knew that Weinstein was a bit of a predator, but it kind of took that Ronan Farrow article to really kind of kick off. So I'm just wondering if you've done any thinking or research into is it the salience of the precipitating event? Is it timing? Is it credibility? What is it that makes a precipitating event that and not just another, you know, haystack that rolls by that some people notice but doesn't cause change? It's a really interesting question, and I have a, an interesting answer, which is uh, sheer salience. And one way to make that, I think, slightly more interesting is that uh, Daniel Kahneman's first kind of uh, big publication is a book called Attention and Effort. It was published before he did his work with Kahneman and Tversky. And it's a book about cognition. And the idea is devoting attention is effortful. And uh, 2017 late, I think the most ambitious, terrific paper the most ambitious, uh, the paper that on the ambition scale is on 1 to 100 and 100, and terrific on the scale of 1 to 100. So it's not just unbelievably ambitious, it's also unbelievably good. It's called Behavioral Inattention, and it's by Xavier Gabu. I'm probably mangling the pronunciation, but he's at Harvard, my colleague and kind of my friend. So apologies, friend and colleague, for mangling your <laughs> name and pronunciation. But uh, it's, it tries to organize a host of behavioral findings under the rubric of attention. And if there's any idea that can be a single organizing one, that's a really good candidate. And then the idea is, how do you get claim attention? And the reason hashtag made two got going was there was intense salience. Um, I think that's all we have time for, but thank you again so much for being here with us. Thank you.